Hello, and welcome to this presentation on the dangers of backtesting, as portrayed in Chapter 11 of the book Advances in Financial Machine Learning by Marcos Lopes de Prat. So this presentation will follow the structure of this chapter. So we'll start with the motivation for this chapter. We'll then go through Mission Impossible, the flawless backtest, and see some of the most common errors when backtesting. Then we'll see that even if your backtest is flawless, it is probably wrong, and address some of the mistakes that even experts still make. Then we'll see that backtest is not a research tool. This is something that the author really uh, makes note of and, and points out in, in this chapter. Then we'll see some general recommendations, particularly in dealing with backtest overfitting. And then uh, we'll talk about strategy selection. So taking into account all these, all the dangers of backtesting and, and, and the difficulties, uh, how to finally select a winning strategy. And then finally, uh, I'll go uh, uh, through some references uh, that are pointed out throughout this uh, presentation. So on the motivation for this chapter, the author points out that backtesting is one of the most essential and yet least understood techniques in the quant arsenal. Basically, the intent of this chapter is to show that most backtesting is flawed. And, and backtests are flawed because they incur in a multitude of different errors, errors made by both beginners and experts in their fields. And, and the intent is sort of to point out these most common errors. So we start off the chapter with Mission Impossible, the flawless backtest. A good backtest can be extremely helpful, but backtesting well is extremely hard. So backtesting, to putting it simply, uh, is a historical simulation of model results versus past reality over a given period of time. So backtesting is really uh, apathetical. It's not an experiment, and this is important. It's apathetical in the sense that assumes the future will somewhat replicate a past path. So in pointing out um, the most common errors in backtesting, the author actually references a white paper published by some Deutsche Bank once in 2014 called The Seven Sins of Quantitative Investing. And these are uh, survivor bias, survivorship bias, which is actually using the current investment universe uh, um, and ignoring that some companies could have gone bankrupt or securities could have been listed, uh, etc. So the look ahead bias, which uh, can be um, imagining that you're uh, investing based on uh, information that is usually not publicly available at the moment, uh, like uh, acting on uh, the inflation or some financial statements uh, ratio or something that really wouldn't be publicly available at a time. Storytelling, which would be coming up with uh, some exposed a story to justify some random pattern found in data. Uh, and speaking about data, data mining and data snooping, which is actually uh, training your model on the testing set. Uh, ignoring transaction costs, uh, which is basically not assuming in the results of the strategy, not taking into account the transaction costs um, of, uh, of, of making that investment strategy. Uh, outliers, which is uh, basing your strategy on a few extreme outcomes that could have never uh, happened again uh, as they were observed in the past. And then shorting, like, uh, taking short positions 
uh, without taking in, into into account uh, the funding costs, uh, etc. So, even if your backtest is flawless, it is still probably wrong. The maddening thing about backtesting is that the better you become at it, the more likely false discoveries will pop up. So the other contends that only an expert can produce a truly flawless backtest, one that is reproducible and that is conservative on all aspects. Uh, things that were that we just addressed, such as timings and transaction costs, etc. So he expects that to be an expert, you need to run huge amounts of backtesting. And in doing so, you basically get the possibility of a statistical fluke. Basically, it contends that a false positive is will inevitably come up in running huge amount of tests. So the, the, the corollary of this part is sort of that uh, beginners incur in errors such as the seven scenes that we just talked about, while experts still fall for multiple testing, selection bias, or backtesting overfitting. An aspect that seems important to the author is that a backtest is not a research tool. The author actually points out what he calls uh, a second law of backtesting, which is that backtesting while researching is like drinking and driving. Do not research under the influence of a backtest. So feature importance is a true research tool. This is what you do ex ante when, when you're trying to uh, construct a model that will um, end up being your investment strategy. And you try to understand the features that are driving that model and, 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 and their importance. That is an, uh, an ex ante process. Conversely, Using backtest as a research tool leads to exposed stories, some convoluted explanations for observed alphas. Basically, this is uh, uh, coming up with some random uh, historical patterns that uh, perform well in in the backtest and and that have really no explanation. Um, but but when you try to come up with some story because they fit really well uh, in, in some uh, past moment, uh, which the other sort of compares to uh, getting the lottery tickets for the last game. So if you try enough numbers, you will come up with the numbers that would have won last week's lottery. And you can come up with some story about the, the rationale for choosing those numbers at the time. But if you try to replicate that strategy next week, it will yield no results, obviously. So, uh, it, it, it is really important to understand that the purpose of a backtest is to discard bad models, not to find ways of improving your model. So the corollary of this part is really that if backtest fails, just start all over. Do not try and improve or adapt your model. So if you start all over, the chances for a false discovery will drop substantially. So after taking a look at some of the most common errors in backtesting, we'll take a look at some of the author's general recommendations. How to address backtest overfitting is arguably the most fundamental question in quantitative finance. Why? 
Because if there was an easy answer to this question, investment firms would achieve high performance with certainty, as they would invest only in winning backtests. Finance could become a true science. Backtest overfitting um, arises from the selection bias on multiple backtests. You end up modeling based on backtest performance and end up with some random historical patterns that are unlikely to occur again. You're basically pricing noise over signal. Backtest overfitting is really hard to assess as the probability of false positives changes with the number of tests. And this number of tests is usually either unknown, as the author just didn't took note of it, and did, didn't consider this number of tests at all, or it's simply not shared. And you end up with some published paper with um, a really good positive backtest um, that really provides no context on the number of tests that was performed to get to that positive result. Then the, the author really tries uh, and, and point out that there is no way to prevent overfitting, but still uh, some steps can, can be made to reduce its presence. So you can choose more general models uh, versus more specific models, for instance, um, uh, having a model for an entire asset class instead of having a very specific model for a specific security. You can apply bagging, which is a concept that can be further explored in Chapter 6 of this book. You should only backtest after research is completed. You should record every test that you perform in your backtesting uh, process. And with that, with that result, or taking into account that the, the number of tests, you can then um, find some ways uh, to take overfitting into account. And some of them, uh, and some of them are suggested by the author in uh, papers that he has published. Uh, namely on uh, estimating the probability of backtest overfitting, taking into account the number of tests, and also in um, a paper uh, on deflating the sharp ratio, again, taking into account the number of tests performed. And then you can uh, simulate scenarios rather than history. Uh, a concept that will be further explored in chapter 12 of this book. And then really take into account that if the backtest fails, you should start from scratch, not find some way of adapting or improving your model to perform better in backtesting. So finally, we take a look at strategy selection. So in the end, how do you select your winning strategy? The presence of serial conditionality in labels defeats standard k-fold cross-validation because random sampling will spatter redundant observations into both the training and testing sets. We must find a different, true out-of-sample validation procedure a procedure that evaluates our model on the observations least likely to be correlated redundant to those used to train the model. To this point, we have the walk forward method, a method implemented by the machine learning package scikit-learn in Python. In it, testing moves forward with the goal of preventing leakage. This method can be easily overfit, as without random sampling, there is basically a single path that will be repeated over and over, thus increasing the likelihood of finding a false positive. So like standard cross-validation, some randomiz randomization is needed to avoid performance targeting. 
So the author introduces a cross-validation method for strategy selection that is based on the estimation of the probability of backtesting overfitting. And to really understand this method, I, I recommend reading the paper by Bailey, P Prado, and some other authors published in 2017 that really um, uh, first introduces this method and that uh, characterizes a backtest overfitting event as a strategy that uh, delivers maximum performance when in sample and then systematically underperforms out of sample. It also establishes a framework for assessing the probability of backtest overfitting and then finally provides an algorithm to test for the null hypothesis of backtest overfitting. So in the end, you can choose uh, a strategy, an investment strategy that has um, positive performance in backtesting while showing little evidence of fitting into the null hypothesis of this test. Finally, I leave you with the complete references found throughout this presentation. Thank you for your attention.